Hi. I'm so thankful to be able to have this time with you, and I really do mean that. I'm thankful that God went before us and enabled us to be able to have the, the equipment and, and the availability in my home to be able to record these times with you and bring them to you. You would normally be uh, at Help for Hurting Women when this will be posted, ladies. And uh, because every Monday night, we're usually on campus from 7 to 8.30 doing Help for Hurting Women. God meets us in the most glorious and amazing ways and has for decades now. Uh, I will often say we're there every single Monday night, unless it's a national holiday or a hurricane. Well, we're not there now on Monday nights because we're in the midst of COVID-19. We are yielding um, willingly to uh, the social distancing and the guidelines that have been given to us uh, by our president, our governor, our local authorities, and we are just trusting God. We are in Passover time right now. Um, yesterday, when I'm recording this, yesterday was Good Friday. Tomorrow is Easter. We can't be together physically, but we can be together with our hearts and in spirit. And I thank God for that. I really do. So just stay with us. We, we're, um, we will not be having uh, gathering together physical church services or classes. Um, we're at least following this guideline until April 30, and then we will reevaluate as we come into May. We're just believing God that soon and very soon we will be able to be together. As I think about Easter and Good Friday, we often think about the darkness that is associated with that Good Friday, with the suffering, with what it was that Jesus endured, um, and just going to the cross for us, for the forgiveness of our sins, for the healing of our bodies, that torture and beating that he took upon his physical body, for our healing in the shed blood, for the forgiveness of our sins. But I often think about the darkness that is associated with Good Friday. Um, darkness overcame Judas uh, as the enemy of his soul just came and he yielded to that plan. Jesus said in John 10.10, 10, the enemy comes only to kill, steal, and destroy. But then Jesus went on to say, but I have come that you might have life and have that abundantly. And in that same time period, Jesus was in the garden, and that darkness came to attempt to overcome him. But he overcame the darkness and yielded to God's perfect will, his Father's perfect will for us. It's amazing to me. I, I've thought about darkness in many ways, and um, I've often taught from Proverbs 31, which talks about um, an amazing, noble, and virtuous woman who is strong, and that word that is used there, noble, in the Old Testament literally means that she was strong in all moral and mental qualities. And you know, this is precisely um, how God intends for us to be. And yes, this is written about a woman, for a woman, for women, but it is surely applicable to men as well. Strong in all moral and mental qualities. Let me ask you something. How many of you are early risers by your nature? Now, I'm talking about very early, like before sunrise early. Uh, the, I'm really not so much into that. When I have gone to the Hope International Dominican trips, there are times when we arise uh, at 4.45 a.m. Um, that's a bit early for me. I've always been a morning person, but that never really meant before dawn. <laughs> but there, it's so interesting because there's a powerful attribute that is listed in Proverbs 31.15 as an imperative for those spiritually strong. Spiritually strong. And it says, she gets up while it is still night, while it is still dark, and she sets about the work that God has given her to do. You know, I grew up on a farm in southwestern Ohio, 
uh, in the, the beginning days of my life, up until my late teens, we farmed about 150 acres, not aggressively, but we did have a 150 acre farm and then um, became involved in farming that was thousands of acres. But there's always been a saying that you um, make hay while the sun shines, which further implied it was up in the dark to be ready for when the sun was shining. Well, this Easter, I've been thinking about something. I've been thinking about someone, Mary Magdalene. Those of you who've read the Gospels, you're familiar with Mary Magdalene. In fact, she is mentioned repeatedly in the Gospels. You think of the darkness that she came out of. She came out of deep, spiritual, emotional, and physical darkness of demonic oppression when Jesus ministered unto her and set her free. You know what? Out of that, she made decisions that we read about and read about and read about in the Gospels. She became a faithful Christ follower. She was there as a friend to Jesus, as a disciple of Jesus Christ, as we are, and as a witness to the resurrection. Ah, the first witness. How stunning is that? Listen to this, John 20, starting at verse one from the New International Version. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved. That's John writing of himself. You need to understand he's not excluding everyone else. It's John who wrote, for God so loved the world. John just knew Jesus loved him. And she said to them, they've taken the Lord out of the tomb and we don't know where they've put him. So Peter and the other disciple started to the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter came along behind him and went straight into the tomb. You see, what's interesting about this is that John is speaking in the third person. That was John. John was young. He outran Peter to the tomb. Then Simon Peter came along behind him and went straight into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place, separate from the linen. And finally, the other disciple who'd reached the tomb first also went inside and he saw and believed. They still did not understand from scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead, but they knew he was gone. Then the disciples went back to where they were staying. But now Mary stood outside the tomb crying. Consider her darkness, her spiritual darkness, her emotional darkness, her Jesus, her Lord, her teacher. He was gone. He had totally changed her life. And out of her totally changed life, she had totally given it to him and had followed him. Amazing. Now Mary stood outside the tomb crying, and as she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white, seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. And they asked her, woman, why are you crying? They've taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they've put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize 
that it was Jesus. And he asked her, woman, why are you crying? Who is it that you are looking for? Can you see him smiling? Can you see him smiling? Woman, why are you crying? Who is it that you're looking for? And thinking he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you've carried him away, just tell me where you've put him, and I will get him. She wanted to anoint him with those burial, beautiful fragrances and meaningful fragrances. She wanted to anoint him. So she says, sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you've put him and I will get him. And Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said, now don't hold on to me, for I've not yet ascended to my father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my father and your father, to my God and your God. And Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. Can you even imagine her rejoicing that she got up out of her total grief and heartache and went out while it was still dark to do the work that God had given her to do. She thought the work was go and anoint the dead body. Oh no, that was not the work. The work was go and tell I'm alive. I am alive indeed. This is resurrection life. You know the title of what I'm teaching right now, I entitled it this morning. It's called, Get Up, It's Sunrise. But sunrise is spelled S-O-N. Get up, it's sunrise. Can you say amen? How glorious is this? Now, you know what? We can apply so much to our lives. It's obvious. Um, that we need personal time with God. We are in the midst of this COVID-19 thing. We, this has been going on for some weeks now. For some of you, many more weeks than for others. For some of you, you are more locked in, more closed in than others. It's obvious we need personal time. If we're going to get up out of any darkness that is attempting to overtake us, we need to read the word, meditate, pray, listen, and we need to do this, if I can say this, prophylactically, big word, $50 word, which means we do it in advance to be prepared for when the darkness tries to come to overtake us. But it's not so obvious when we become deceived that we need to get up and get out of dark places. You know, um, when we're able to do How Furting Women, I just love it that our Teen Challenge women in Fort Myers are able to come and be with us. Usually about 15 of them come on Monday nights to be with us. They understand exactly what it means that they needed to get up and get out of dark places. Dark nightclubs, dark bars, dark places of using drugs, but Getting up, yes, that's, that's totally understandable. But we also need to understand that there are times when we need to get up out of our dark places, spiritually, emotionally. I don't know, now that we're weeks into this, how you are really dealing with the separation. Some of you not able to work. Some of you unsure where the provision will come from. My heart is with you, my prayers are with you, but do not let this darkness overtake you. That's my heart for today. Get up, it's sunrise, he is risen. 
You know, I often think about um, years ago on a Tuesday night when my mother had been in the hospital for, I, I think that was the time that she was in for a month. And um, this particular time they called for me. Oh, I know what happened. I brought her in through the emergency room. They ended up admitting her and I did not leave until midnight. And when I walked out of the emergency to go back to my car, a car pulled up with several young men in it. They pulled up, they opened the door, they pulled a young man out who was in the middle of an overdose, a seizure, he was contorted, he was foaming at the mouth, and they just laid him on the ground and they left him. As if to say, here, fix this. I just watched the car pull away, and I didn't only pray for the young man on the ground. I prayed for them, and I thanked God that at least they brought him. You see, we need to get up <laughs> and know it's sunrise before we OD on anything that the enemy of our souls has prepared and is serving up to try to destroy us. Again, John 10.10, 10, the enemy comes only, Jesus said, to kill, steal, and destroy. But Jesus said, I've come that you might have life, and it's resurrection life. So let's just consider getting up. You know, sometimes we feel that where we are is in a deep, dark pit. One of those other times, <laughs> That mother was in the hospital, could have been that same time, I don't remember. I got a call. Um, in the morning, from the nurse who said that during the night, from 4.30 to 6.30 a.m., that my mother had almost died. She went into a powerful, AFib situation with her heart. She lived. I saw her at 8.30 in the morning. They did a miraculous upper GI. They saw some things that needed to be done. But during that time, she had, she figured it was the end. And she had joyfully, peacefully, gone through all of her prayer list. She had verbally said goodbye to everyone who she loved. Her heart came into rhythm. And guess what? It was time for hellos again. She'd said all her goodbyes and now it was time to say hellos again. And she was incredibly thankful. We were all thankful. We were all praising God. And they were able to do a procedure that day that they needed to do. But that night, that very night, worry and anguish over the hospital bill, and there was no reason for her to be working, worrying over the hospital bill. She had fabulous insurance. Satan just came like with tentacles, like an octopus to squeeze her and drag her into a pit of darkness. It didn't make any sense, but it happened. And it was so real to her. And it might even be happening to you. You know, it's interesting about pits. <laughs> sometimes we walk into them. Sometimes we even jump in due to our poor choices. Sometimes we're pushed. And sometimes we just fall in unaware that it was awaiting us just like now. For some of you, it was that moment. This happened. You don't know where provision is coming from. You don't know if your loved one who is dealing with this virus or something else very serious, you don't know how they're going to make it through this. It's that moment. And that darkness starts to close in. Well, I have good news for you. It's truly 
what makes Good Friday good and what makes Easter absolutely spectacular. This is what Jesus completed for you. Psalm 103 tells us at the beginning, he forgives all our sins, he heals all our diseases, and he redeems, present tense, our life from the pit. Glory to God. Grab hold of that one and claim it for yourself. In Psalm 40, one through th three, a Psalm of David, he, he, led by the Holy Spirit, he writes that God has come to lift you from the pit. So what I'm saying to you, I'm saying, get up, stretch out your heart and your hand. He hears your cry. It's sunrise, S-O-N-R-A-S-E. John told us that true light was coming into the world and it came. Jesus is our light and our life. He said to us in John 8, I am the light of the world, and whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. We must get up, know it's sunrise, and follow him, and he will show you what that means right where you are. I promise you. In 2 Samuel 22, you, Lord, are my lamp. The Lord turns my darkness into light. And in Acts, we're told that the Lord has made us a light that we might bring salvation to the world. Ephesians tells us that we were once in darkness but now we are light and we're called to let our light so shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Take these to your heart today. Take these to your hurting heart today. I was a little girl who grew up in church and I learned to sing, this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. I'm going to let it shine. I'm going to let it shine. Hide it under a bushel. Let it be hidden in a pit. No. Let it shine. And then we would sing, let it shine till Jesus comes. I'm going to let it shine. So let me remind you again, Jesus said to us, John 16, 33, in this world, we will have trouble. But he went on to say, take heart, take courage. I have overcome the world. I have done teachings for you now. Release your grasp on how things have been. Live in Psalm 91. You are protected. Stay, stayed, stay, stayed. Isaiah 23. He will keep in perfect peace those whose minds are stayed on him. Practically, let me remind you again. I taught from Psalm 34 last week. It talks about being hurt, it talks about being heard, and it talks about being helped. God is faithful. No matter what it is that we're facing right now, he wants to make himself so real to you. Get up out of whatever is oppressing you. It's sunrise. So let me close by reading to you from Max Lucado's devotional on Calvary's Hill. On my YouVersion Bible app, I pulled this up a week ago, and I have to be honest, I skipped ahead. This is actually the one for Easter morning, but I just love it. 
Listen to this. An unexpected party. A party was the last thing Mary Magdalene expected as she approached the tomb on that Sunday morning. The last few days had brought nothing to celebrate. To her, the last few days had brought nothing but tragedy. In the early morning, and we read in the Word, she got up while it was still dark. In the early morning mist, she arises from her mat, takes her spices and aloes, and leaves her house, past the gate of Geneth and up to the hillside. She anticipates a somber task. By now the body will be swollen and death's odor will be pungent. A gray sky gives way to gold as she walks up the narrow trail. As she rounds the final bend, she gasps. The rock in front of the grave is pushed back. When she stoops down and sticks her head into the entrance, she sees what looks to be a man, but he's radiantly white. He is one of two lights on either end of the vacant slab. Why are you crying? An uncommon question to be asked in a cemetery. In fact, the question is rude. That is, unless the questioner knows something that the questionee doesn't. They have taken my Lord away, and I don't know where they've put him. She still calls him my Lord. As far as she knows, his lips were silent. As far as she knows, his corpse has been carted off by grave robbers. But in spite of all this, he is still her Lord. Such devotion moves Jesus. It moves him closer to her. So close, she hears him breathing. She turns, and there he stands, and she thinks he is the gardener. Why are you crying? Who is it you're looking for? He doesn't leave her wondering long, just long enough to remind us that he loves to surprise us. He waits for us to despair of our human strength and then intervenes with heavenly. God waits for us to give up and then surprise. And listen to the surprise as Mary's name is spoken by a man she loved, a man she had buried, Mary. God appearing at the strangest places, doing the strangest of things, stretching smiles where there had hung only frowns, placing twinkles where there were only tears, hanging a bright sty in a dark a bright star in a dark sky, arching rainbows in the midst of of thunderclouds and calling names in a cemetery. Mary, he said softly, surprise. I would say, sunrise, S-O-N, surprise. Mary was shocked. It's not often you hear your name spoken by an eternal tongue. But when she did, she recognized it. And when she did, she responded correctly. She worshiped him. Heavenly Father, we just come to you right now. Thank you for giving us this time. I thank you, Lord. You know why, where we are. You know right what we're feeling. My mind goes to those who I know are struggling during this time. 
It's dark, it's difficult. And I just ask you, God, to go right now personally, speak their name, and allow them to be so attuned to your spirit that they hear it. As you say, get up, I'm risen, it's sunrise. I'm here for you, I love you, and I will help you. Lord, I ask you to make this so personal and tangible to every single one who is listening right now. And if there's a single one who has not ever invited this living resurrected Christ into his or her heart to just experience what Mary experienced, I ask you, Lord, that this would be their moment and I would ask you, if that's you, just repeat after me right now. Dear Heavenly Father, I know I need a Savior. Jesus, I believe you're alive. Come into my heart. Be my Savior. Be my Lord. Forgive me of every way that I have sinned. I thank you for your shed blood on Calvary. And I thank you that it cleanses me still. This is it. This is my day of sunrise. I'm getting up. I'm following you, Jesus, for all of eternity, because you have called my name in Jesus' name. I pray that this time together has touched you. It's touched me. I'm very thankful for these times that the Lord is giving us together. I just believe that no matter what it is you're experiencing right now, you're going to get up spiritually. You're going to let God meet you at the place of your need because he's alive. He has risen indeed. So I say to you, until I can see you face to face, until I can hug you, until we can be together again, it's time for us all to get up because it's sunrise. Amen and amen.